Hi guys, for today's video, I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite mentor relationships in fiction. While most of the things I'm gonna be talking about are from books, I am gonna mention a couple of other things from other forms of entertainment, just cause I think it's fun and I wanna mention those too. A lot of you who watch my channel rather regularly probably already know the first two I'm gonna mention, so I'm just gonna get them out of the way at the very beginning, which would be Kelsier and Vin from Mistborn and then Geralt and Siri from Witcher. I'm gonna start with Geralt and Siri. They are, for me, one of my absolute favorite mentor relationships in fiction, which is obvious, that's the whole point of this video, but them in particular, just because they kind of are not your typical mentor relationship pair. So I absolutely love having this rough, gruff character have to have this relationship with this young girl. I know a lot of people have watched the Netflix show and a lot of people have played the video game, which the video game is how I was introduced to Witcher and Siri is much older in the video game because if you don't know, the video game is supposed to be a what if uh, as far as what would happen after the books. It's not technically canon, although, although a lot of fans treat it as such. But either way, in the books, when Geralt and Ciri are first interacting, she is a little girl. And seeing him, somebody who's used to being on his own, somebody who doesn't necessarily think about very often what other people think or feel because he's been conditioned to not do that because in the end it hurts him. That's part of being a witcher. Everybody hates you. And even when you try to care for them, they typically don't have that in turn for you. So he's just kind of been conditioned to do his own thing. And then he's confronted with this young girl who's supposedly his destiny and the interactions between them are fantastic. But their backgrounds could not be more unalike. Geralt is a witcher and then Ciri is a princess. So she's used to kind of being pampered. She's a little bit spoiled. And so he sort of has to take that away a little bit and try to expose her to the horrors of the world without wanting to expose her to those things. But also there's certain aspects of his personality that he kind of can't help, but sort of have bleed into their relationship. So an example would be at one point, he's like showing her how to blow snot out of her nose, stuff like that. It's very silly, but they're just, I just love them so much. And the amount that he cares for her and he's constantly wondering, is it just because of this whole thing of destiny? But you're like, no, it's definitely not, Geralt, because because you love her like a daughter and it's just the best. And if for those of you who have played the video game, there's a scene where he's worried about her and he thinks something has happened and that scene is incredible and that sealed the deal for me, even then, before I even read the books. I mentioned Kelsier and Vin, so dedicating a little bit of time to the two of them. If you have not read Mistborn, this is a story that follows a group of people who have the ability to ingest metals and gain certain powers from them, and they are trying to take down like the ultimate bad guy. That's the kind of setup. And Kelsier is somebody who has a lot of knowledge on how to use his powers. And then Vin is somebody who he kind of takes under his wing and is trying to train, is trying to teach her how to trust, is trying to give her a cause worth fighting for. Vin has been burned so many times. She's very reluctant to having relationships with other people in general, but she's especially fearful and suspicious at first. She's constantly thinking that somebody is gonna try to do something and somebody's gonna take advantage of me and I'm gonna have to leave as soon as it seems like there's a little bit of something shady going on. She's constantly on edge and he is constantly having to be patient and loving toward her. Once again, we have kind of a daughter-father type of relationship between the two of them. But in general, he is not necessarily a perfect person. And it's really, I think, a good take on the mentor relationship because this is something that I feel like it's almost like a coming of age theme that so many people experience is recognizing that your parents are human beings too, or recognizing that older generations, they're just human beings trying to do their best. And the older you get, the more you realize like, oh shoot, nobody knows what they're doing. And Vin is kind of discovering while she cares about this person and she's learning from them, at the same time, there are aspects of them and what they believe in that she doesn't always agree with. And sometimes they butt heads, but at the end of the day, they just, are amazing. I absolutely love their relationship. It's so fantastic. Next up, kind of switching genres here, we have Scythe by Neil Schusterman and specifically Scythe Faraday and our two main characters, Rowan and Citra. A lot of people, when they hear the premise for this, and it's true for when I describe it as well, they talk about the general setup of the story, which is that it's a futuristic society and technology has advanced so much and there's so many advancements in medicine that there really is no 
fear of death anymore. There's no fear of war. We've pretty much conquered death. And the only thing threatening mankind is overpopulation. And as a result, there are individuals called scythes whose job it is to go around and permanently end someone's life. If they choose somebody to die, then that person, whatever it is that kind of will cure them, that will not be activated. That's a poor way of describing it, but that's the general idea. And so Scythe Faraday is one of our main characters, and the two others, Rowan and Citra, are his apprentices. They do not want to be in this position, they do not want to become Scythes, but Scythe Faraday is somebody who, what I think is so great about this is you're talking about a, a killer, somebody whose job it is to hurt and end people's lives, and he is one of the most honorable characters I feel like I've come across. He puts so much thought and effort into what he does, and he is very compassionate, which you wouldn't expect. So I absolutely love just his character in general, but also him trying to pass that on to his young apprentices who want nothing to do with this, understandably. But the way in which they start to see that there, there is a need for this and the way they go about it should demand respect. It's just, I think, an absolutely fascinating mentor relationship, but also just in general, like I said, the character type the, of this killer being the person who's actually really compassionate and filled with empathy. I just think it's absolutely amazingly done. Next up, I'm sprinkling in one of the things that's not from a book series, and that would be Nandor and Guillermo from What We Do in the Shadows. If you do not know, What We Do in the Shadows is my favorite TV show. It is ridiculous, but it's also very clever. It follows these vampires who are living in modern times and who are trying to kind of get used to modern life with all of the things that go along with stereotypes of vampires, like they can't go out in the sunlight, they sleep in coffins, all those sorts of things. Guillermo is a human man who has been promised that someday he will be turned into a vampire by his master, Nandor. And he's kind of been held onto for a while with this promise. It's what keeps him around to do all of the dirty work and all of the errands for the vampires. It's a mockumentary, so it's like if you've watched The Office or Parks and Rec, it's filmed in that way. It's a little more, I think, aware of the whole there's cameraman filming sort of situation. It's absolutely ridiculous. It is so funny, but Nandor and Guillermo somehow... <laughs> Nandor is kind of terrible, not kind of, he is pretty terrible to Guillermo, but at the same time, he seems to have this friendship with him. Like, Guillermo is obviously his best friend, and Guillermo is kind of obsessed with Nandor. And it's so funny. I need more people to watch this show because it's fantastic. I love it, and I love the two of them. One of my neighbors is working on something outside, so if you hear something noisy, that's what that is. Going back around to books that I talk about all the time, we have Fireborn by Rosaria Munda, and specifically we have Lee and Annie and their relationship with Atreus. So this is one where I think if you've read the first book and the second also, but in general, if you've read this before, you know that there are so many layers to this relationship that you can't even begin to dissect in a non-spoiler way, but just kind of surface level how this is such a complicated relationship. So Atreus, the setup for this story is it's kind of a fantasy take on revolution, like French Revolution, Russian Revolution. And so it's a little bit ahead in the time period that fantasy is typically inspired by. And on top of that, we are looking at basically historical fiction, but with dragons. Atreus is the person who led the revolution, which is not that complicated as far as his relationship with the character Annie, who was a part of the lower classes and therefore was oppressed by the previous people in power. But the other person who Annie is best friends with, he's actually royalty, who is living his life now, kind of hidden identity, and he actually does believe in the ideals that Atreus teaches, even though Atreus is responsible for the killing of Lee's family. So it's a very complicated relationship, and I absolutely love the ways in which Lee, for example, he was kind of growing up to believe he was better than people, but he doesn't actually believe he was better than people, and so he believes in what Atreus is saying, but then sometimes it's like, oh yeah, Atreus killed my family, it's sort of hard to get that out of my mind, and then Annie just thinks that Atreus is this hero, but then doesn't always agree with everything that he is doing. Absolutely love this relationship. One of the many reasons that this story is constantly 
something I talk about all the time. Next up, we have a manga slash anime, and that would be Full Metal Alchemist, specifically the brothers Edward and Alphonse, and their relationship with their teacher. I don't have a whole lot to say. I mean, it's kind of your core true mentor relationship where this person is a positive influence on their lives, but she also was really hard on them, and she forced them to do all these absurd things in order to learn these life lessons and become stronger or realize the strength that they always had in their hearts, that sort of a thing. I, there's really not a whole lot I would say to expand on that, or at least things that aren't spoilery, but I just, I mean, I love Full Metal Alchemist and the relationship with their teacher. Something with Full Metal Alchemist that I think a lot of fans would agree with is that it's actually very funny. And while it's funny, it's also very heartwarming and sometimes heart-wrenching. And I feel like all of that is true when it comes to Edward and Alphonse's relationship with their teacher. Just always more to all the side characters than first meets the eye. Next up, we have Age of Assassins by RJ Barker. And this particular mentor relationship involves our main character, Gurton, and his master. So Gurton is the apprentice to an assassin. So in some ways, this is slightly mirroring the scythe relationship there because our main mentor figure is somebody who kills people and then is teaching somebody else how to kill people. What I really love about this one though is this is an adult fantasy and it's kind of a coming of age story and so this mentor figure is like a parent. But what I love is that we typically see the mentor relationship involving, at least in this kind of a fantasy, I feel like you so often see the mentor as a man. And so to have this almost maternal mother figure, I know I was just talking about Full Metal and that's a woman as well, but this is more your traditional fantasy setting and your more traditional fantasy relationship between a coming of age young person and their mentor. And I feel like you almost always see this like old wise wizard type of character. And here we have this woman and I think it's also interesting that this woman is the assassin and that she's training a young man to be an assassin as well. So I just like that it was kind of flipped on its head. I also just really love that this woman so obviously very much cares for Gurton, but at the same time she can be quite ruthless. And I would say too that Gurton sometimes has to almost pass on his compassion and his innocence back to his mentor because they have seen so many bad things happen. And so Gurton is kind of still fresh and innocent and not necessarily a pessimist. And I just really like the way that these two, the relationship they have, it warmed my heart. Now pulling from a video game, I have to mention Orin and then Titus and Yuna from Final Fantasy X. So I would say Orin is more so Titus's mentor, but Titus is just constantly, I feel like, kind of yelling and throwing a fit about everything. And he's definitely always directing that at Orin. A very brief attempt at describing the plot of Final Fantasy X. Basically, there's this giant monster called Sin that has this need to destroy and they, our main characters, want to destroy it. And Orin is kind of like the wise older figure who is the one that's sort of always giving them advice, telling them what they need to do. He's kind of grizzled and grumpy. And Titus is this like free spirit. And then Yuna is this very sweet, lovely girl who's just trying to do her best to be a good person in the world and take down this evil sin. And I just love not only Titus's relationship with Orin because Titus is so high energy and he's just so chaotic and Orin is this kind of stoic figure, calm. And then Yuna is so sweet and I feel like Orin a little bit is nicer to Yuna because he treats her slightly different than Titus because Titus is always being Titus, which makes sense if you've played the game. But Yuna and Titus, I feel like both end up having to learn from Orin often, and Orin has a relationship with both of their parents, which is also an interesting factor with the two of them. I love Final Fantasy X. I just want more people to play it. It's so good. Everybody should go back and play Final Fantasy X if they did not experience it when it first came out. They've remastered it. It's wonderful. I love it so much. It's so good. Lastly, this is kind of an honorable mention. Many of you know I don't like typically spending time talking about my own story, but I do really enjoy writing Guinevere and Garen from Peace and Turmoil from my book. So Guinevere is this, it's almost like a geralt Siri relationship in a sense, but Garen has known Guinevere her whole life. He was there when she was born. So Guinevere is this princess and she often is 
kind of used to getting her way, she's a little bit of a temper, and Garen is more so like in temperament Oren from Final Fantasy X, he's very calm, he's not really riled up by most things, whereas Guinevere is this just ball of frustration all the time, and so I really enjoy the differences between the two of them, but how much ultimately they clearly so much care for one another, he is like a father to her, and then she is like a daughter to him, so, you know, I don't want to say too much else, but I do really enjoy writing the two of them. That's it for some of my favorite mentor relationships in fiction. Definitely let me know some of your favorites. Doesn't have to just be from books, like I included stuff from manga, anime, video games, TV shows. You can as well. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you all later. Bye.